Hello again. Chapter 16. We are we are just getting through this book. We are going to work on the financial system. And I and I'm going to assume most of us understand what the financial system is, but the book is going to give you some background details of the financial system. So a lot in a lot of ways it will be an overview for many of you. Um, so let's proceed. Once you complete the chapter, you should uh, understand the following objectives. They should be met. We're going to understand the financial system. We're going to list the various types of securities. We're going to discuss the market, the financial market, and understand the stock market. We're going to evaluate financial institutions and the role of the Federal Reserve System. We're going to describe the regulation of the financial system. And finally, we're going to describe the global perspective of the financial system. And, it's a, and the financial system is really a way of money flows from savers to users. Again, how do we understand the financial system? I would say the first thing you'll need to do is understand who is part of the financial system. We have savers, we have users, we have the institutions and markets. And the savers and users are comprised both of households and government and businesses, depending on their role. And we don't talk about how these individual um, subsets interact with financial institutions and with financial markets. But the bottom line is we transfer our funds between these two for purposes of savings or using of those funds. Financial instruments. That's one of the many ways you can buy securities. Securities are these documents where we will earn rate of return. They provide us some kind of rate of return. So if we are a, if we are a saver, we are going to be purchasing these type of instruments. They include money market instruments, bonds, and stocks. Money market instruments are really like having money into a bank account, which earn a higher level of interest. And given um, the state of the economy, it's not very high. Bonds are um, certificates where an organization or government decides they want to raise money, and they raise money through borrowing, and they um, issue bonds that you or I could purchase with a prevailing interest rate. Stock is ownership of a company. Bonds do not provide ownership at all. It's merely a debt instrument. Money market instruments. They are short term. They are issued by corporations, financial institutions, and governments. We, are, we learn a lot about money markets really from our banks. And when I, when I talk about financial institutions, financial institutions include banks. It is not exclusively banks. And it's very important to know that because people think a financial institution is a bank. No, not necessarily. And we'll, we'll tap on it a little bit here. Investors are paid interest. So if I purchase a money market instrument, I am assured of a certain level of interest for the bank or whatever institution um, actually put, you know, actually abide from. They will pay me for the use of my money. It's almost as if they're loaning, I'm loaning them money in the form of a money market um, um, security. They're not high risk. They're very low risk. Um, generally, it's going to be U.S. Treasury bills or CDs, um, some um, commercial paper. But the bottom line is money market is probably the safest way to save, um, but it does offer low returns. So bonds come in several forms. Government bonds, which are the Treasury Department, U.S. Treasury Department. Municipal bonds are local and state, and corporate bonds. Now, depending on what state you're in, sometimes um, munis, as they're called, are tax-free, meaning that any interest that you earn on those munis um, are, are not subject to taxation. Government bonds are the same way, um, but not all munis are, are tax-free, um, tax but some are. So know your state and what their rules are reg regarding municipal bonds and the, in the interest on the municipal bonds. Corporate bonds, obviously, um, are um, just allowing, your, allowing an organization, a corporation of some sort, to borrow money for, for a period of time, 20 years, 30 years. And they often depend on the organization's strength, their credit ability, and other market conditions that determine how much interest that, that they will be able to pay you for the use of your money. And the schedule here gives you 
really um, the type of bond, I would suggest reading through the list um, of knowing who type, what type of bond is being issued or the issuer of those bonds, the type of bond, and the risk associated with those bonds. Um, the special features just gives you, tells you really how, um, whether or not the interest is exempt or not, and other key information that you'll need to know about that specific type of security. Um, just to review that, the, the information on this, this um, screen is a general overview and it's not very hard to understand. I suggest just, just taking a look at what you're seeing here and understanding what the role of each one of these bonds would provide the, um, the holder of that bond and also the responsibilities of those um, who will be paying that bond back in that time period. Now, bonds generally have ratings and these ratings really will determine the rate. Um, so we had to talk about price. How much is a bond? How much would a bond cost? And all of that stuff. And all of that's really fairly complicated, simply because it really does depend on the rating. And that standard and pores is the standard. Um, is the the I would say, um, the biggest um, rate firm. But Moody's also there as well. Um, so you'll need to know the rating of that bond because the rating of that bond is going to tell you how risky it is. And riskier bonds often pay a higher level of, of interest. And again, when you're dealing with bonds, this is a debt instrument. So they are, they are essentially borrowing money from you. And they're borrowing money at a rate of interest. And the rate of interest is going to depend on if it's speculative, if it's junk, what kind of investment grade it is, what kind of rating that bond has. And that's tied to the organization that's issuing it and the price you pay. So bonds have, can vary. They are not um, overwhelmingly risky, depending on if you get a speculative or a junk bond. But generally speaking, you get a fairly fairly reasonable um, risk level with the um, bonds, and you get a fairly decent um, return on those bonds. Now, again, here, just an overview of Standard & Poor's. Standard & Poor's have these different type of ratings. Obviously, AAA is the best, and then the worst is probably a C. And with that knowledge, you can rate whether or not this organization has a good credit standing. Organizations that are failing, organizations that are in trouble, obviously will be a, called a junk bond and will have the lowest rate. But these rates are important because it does tell you how risky the bond will be. And risk is, well, will you get back the money that you put in? Obviously, you'll probably get the interest, but will you get back that principal? So knowing their standard rating and how they're used to determine the interest rate that they'll pay you uh, for your, the use of your money um, is quite important consideration. Stock is ownership. We know this. And it's ownership in corporations primarily. Um, um, stock is, common stock is the ability to receive dividends. Appreciation of your stock. For example, if you pay $5 a share for stock, and over time the, the, the corporation is doing so well that the market value of the stock changes to $10. Price appreciation is extremely important with common stock. But anyway, um, most importantly, you, um, you vote on major company decisions. So you are owner of that corporation, which is very, very important um, to note. Preferred stock um, is a, a different type of instrument, and they receive preference. I would say the, the most important part of a preferred stock is their preference and dividends. They get dividends first, and if their dividends are cumulative, they get dividends when they're not declared, which is very important. But they are not owners of the company, and they do not uh, vote. Convertible securities. If you have a bond or a preferred stock, you can, depending on the security and the information on that security, you can exchange it. You can exchange a bond to a security. And again, when you have sec um, convertible securities, they're going to cost more, clearly. So if you have a, a, a convertible bond, a bond that allows you to convert it to preferred or common stock, that's so important. That's really important. So it's going to make a difference in the price that you pay. I mean, obviously, convertible um, securities cost more. Uh, preferred stock costs more than common stock in general. And again, these are just the different types of securities that you can keep as they are or change them, depending on what your goals are. Now, talking about the financial markets, um, they, they broke it into two pieces. One is the primary and one is the secondary. Um, primary market is where governments and firms issue securities and initially sell them to the public. And this is for like an IPO, for example. That's just one type of, um, of um, primary market. The secondary market is going to be a collection of markets in which they're previously issued or traded among investors. So 
generally what will happen is if you're going to go out to the marketplace and purchase security, you're going to be dealing with the secondary market. Um, it's generally, that's going to be the general rule. So how does the market work, really? The market or the market exchange is where they're bought and sell on the market on the New York Stock Exchange. And this happens across the globe. This is not just in the United States. It's all over. Every single trading exchange happens there. It's a very major, major place where activity um, is um, activity between investors and, and, and bond markets and shares, all of that stuff. It's very, very complicated um, process, but it is all occurring within the Wall Street in New York City. So there are the stock exchanges, the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ Stock Exchanges. And again, just take a look in your book and it just gives you how many stocks that they actually um, are listed on their, their exchange. Obviously, the New York Stock Exchange is a big one. It's very, very famous. It's probably the oldest. But don't let NASDAQ, you know, be sold under the, under the carpet. I mean, NASDAQ has, has its own um, uh, it's, it's, it's own popularity in its own right. And there are 5,000 companies that are listed in the NASDAQ. And usually these are smaller firms. The bigger firms are going to be in the New York Stock Exchange. Why is that, really? Think about it. As you're reading through the chapter, why would one a company would be in the New York Stock ex Exchange versus uh, the NASDAQ? That's the major thing to think about. Nothing too complicated. Just think about that question. Um, there are other stock markets which are listed here, not prominent very well, but the main ones you're going to be seeing um, in general, particularly in the news, is going to be the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ. Electronic communication networks. Well, the, again, these are places where you can buy and sell, but you don't have to physically go anywhere. It's all online. It's a virtual exchange. And again, it's just a, another way for buyers and sellers or buyers and users or to come together and exchange the sale of stocks for a price. Investor participation in the stock market. Well, again, when we buy stock, we usually buy it through someone who has the ability to do deal directly with these firms. And what we do is we go to a brokerage firm. Brokerage firms are the ones who actually execute the trade on behalf of the investor. They charge a fee for it, but the main thing is you don't have to get into the nitty-gritty of all of that, the paperwork and everything that's involved in actually buying and selling stock. You leave it to a brokerage firm which has the ability, the connections, and the accounts so that you, they can establish the accounts for you and trade on your behalf. And they also are men and women who have the skills to know how to trade and will allow you to, to earn the most money for your trade. So they are most certainly are people, people that you want to work with because they have that sophisticated knowledge. Institutions include banks. That's why I wanted to make certain it's very, very important to um, make clear financial institution does not exclusively mean a bank. It also means a bank, but it doesn't exclusively mean a bank because institution could be non-depository institutions. Uh, uh, a brokerage firm could be a, a financial institution. Savings and, ba savings and banks and then credit unions. So there's no a distinction among these three and what their roles typically are in the, in the, um, in the financial system. This is just giving you an overview and a chart, a bar chart of the billions of assets these various organizations maintain. And as you can see, commercial banks is pretty much high up there. Why? Because everybody uses commercial bank. We use it for our own daily um, checking and savings accounts and so forth. But we also use it for lending us money to buy a car, for us to buy a house. So financial institution in the form of commercial bank is huge, and there's no question about it. But then we have the savings. We have the... Um, savings and credit unions, the life insurance companies, pension funds, and mutual funds. And the pension and mutual funds generally relate to um, employers who have these 401k plans or 457 plans who establish funds to invest on behalf of the employees as a part of their retirement planning. Electronic banking, we already know about these because we do it every day. And I think most of us uh, receive money through EFTs when we get our paychecks. Um, but businesses now use that, and it's a very uh, important part of our banking transactions now because most things are done electronically. 
um, social security payments, payments from their from the state government. Um, almost always they're going to be treated this way, and that's why they might think it's become the new check in the um, 21st century. Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. This um, old corporation, it, it does provide a level of insurance protection in the likely event, in the unlikely event, excuse me, uh, corp uh, a bank would go under. And people, you know, banks do not have all the money in their accounts to pay every single depositor. We know this. But what the uh, federal insurance provides is if the corp if the bank is not able, for whatever reason, to meet its obligation to you, a depositor, the federal insurance uh, corporation will step in and insure. Now, we have we had this issue before? We came close to it a few years ago, and what the bank and what the government did was allow other banks to take it over to avoid having to um, pay each one of the depositors hundred thousand dollars to, to keep them from losing all of their money so it's a very tricky situation and the federal reserve um, the federal deposit insurance corporation is a very important part of our financial system but it's important to make certain that they're there just to make sure we have confidence in banking that we can put our money in and we know that we can get our money back when we decide to get our money back that's what's called a demand deposit account but it does shift the risk the risk of bank failure from the individual to the FDIC. And again, there are limitations. There's a cap to how much it's going to um, insure, but the bottom line is most oftentimes when a bank is going to go under, rather than having to pay all the, the depositors their account, the, um, the Federal um, Deposit Insurance Company will, um, will uh, coordinate a bank takeover, which will allow the banks to remain viable um, and uh, thus avoid it from going bankrupt. Saving banks and, and credit unions, again, these are um, organizations much smaller than commercial banks, but they have so much more flexibility, and they offer much competitive rates when you're talking loans. Um, most people like the credit unions because they are shareholder-owned, meaning if you, are a, if you have an account, you are owner of that, of that bank, and that bank shares, obviously shares the the returns to the depositors. So it's very, very different from a commercial bank, which is often obviously owned privately or uh, or is maybe a corporation on the stock exchange. But credit unions are different. They are small generally. They offer um, real estate loans, et cetera. But the most important thing is they offer higher le levels of interest and the returns that you receive or that the credit union receives is always give back to the depositor. So credit unions um, also serve they are also under the National Credit Union Administration, which is very much like the FDIC. It ensures that credit unions have sufficient funds to pay any depositors when they, um, if they were to call, you know, come back and get all their money. So, non-depository financial institutions, again, sh insurance companies. I mean, Nash. I mean, uh, they are definitely financial institutions, but they're not where you can't go in there. And, okay, I want to make a deposit. Or I want to withdraw cash. They're not um, depository. You cannot make deposits in these um, financial institutions. Pension funds, finance companies, and mutual funds. I mentioned pension funds and um, mutual funds simply because they generally work under the institutional uh, level by buying on behalf of plans like 401ks. Insurance companies, clearly, if you buy insurance policy from, um, let's see, what kind of insurance company? National, I think, um, um, nationwide. Nationwide would be considered an example of insurance company, and they p obviously have deposits that come from the individuals who are buying insurance policies. And when the person dies or some catastrophic event occurs, the insurance companies have to pay out. Obviously, these are not companies where you can go in and make deposits and withdraw on a daily basis. But the main thing is they are institutions, and they need to be noted in the financial institution um, role. The Federal Reserve is um, it, the Federal Reserve. It, it controls the flow of money. It is um, it regulates commercial banks. It provides in services for them. It sets policy, monetary monetary policy. It is definitely controlled by the United States government. Um, the, the the President of the United States does appoint the um, the President of the Federal Reserve. It is considered in a separate legal entity, but it def definitely works with it, the um, with the government administration to ensure that the interest rates and the monetary policy is consistent with the with the um, the, the presidential um, president's um, policy. 
it is also a regulator of banks meaning they have to make certain they they enforce rules on certain commercial banks in terms of how much of reserve they need to maintain how much um loans that they need to have and also considering also the um loans default the, the federal reserve is a very very huge part of the financial system and its primary responsibility is going to be regulating commercial banks and setting monetary policy um this is just a breakdown of the federal reserve it um each one it has 12 districts and each and each district has a certain number of banks that are covered under that the board of governors is one of the organizational structures that that i would say runs the organization it is it's supposed to be politically independent and in many ways it is um but it also sets policy regarding monetary um and interest rates and again that is definitely considered something political so i would say that they work alongside with the president to ensure that the monetary policy and interest rates are under control particularly during a recession and we are very much aware of this because this happened in 2008 and 2009 and 2010 where interest rate was a major concern um the monetary policy of the president had to be cons- they had to be very much monitored simply because people were not making much money and the interest rates were high and it was just a very difficult time so the federal reserve is pretty quiet for a good amount of time because the, their main job is to re- to regulate the commercial banks however um there comes a time when the economy is such that it um the federal reserve becomes more prominent and and, and politically out there for people to s- to understand and see what they do and that's what it comes down to with the interest rates that their government's going to allow to be charged and and etc et and the flow of money how much money is going to be out in circulation that is a major part of the federal reserve responsibility now check cleared in the fed okay again we still write ch- um paper checks i mean i may write one or two every two or three months but the bottom line is it does have to do with the achs as well but it does regulate how monies are transferred from one account to another account and again this is a 21st century thing with to where a lot of us are doing things electronically and we see our money go two days later or one day later this process has gone it's gotten much more streamlined because of the um the electronic process that most people are using to pay their bills so the policy the monetary policy in essence is just really controlling the the sup- the, fly, the flow of money and controlling interest rates that's the big thing and it's more complicated than what we're going through here but get an overview of what the policy is it sets a discount rate that discount rate relates to commercial banks and that's the rate that the banks pay the federal reserve for the use of their services the banks maintain reserves they have to check and monitor how much money they have in their bank vaults at any time to cover the processors who demand their money and it does measure the monetary supply and it is in the open market operation so it's very much a a a, a, a body where it's involved in the financial um aspects of the nation and that includes the markets that includes the banks and that includes the supply of money and the and the flow of credit these are just two types of of a money market funds and the currency demand and again all of this information is not really helpful unless you understand what role the, the um the federal reserve play within our our banking and with our monetary system and again the more money that's in circulation the less it's worth so controlling how much money that's in the in circulation is a very important um tool that the reserve uses to control interest rates this here is just another um uh overview of the the tools that the the federal reserve uses to control growth or regulate growth in the money supply and this is far more complicated but i would suggest you just reviewing this little grid and understanding in general what um the re- what the role of the federal reserve is and how it does it just in a general terms don't get so enamored into the detail because this is a very complicated area of finance and many classes cover this subject so it's very important to know this is far more um involved than what I'm presenting in this presentation. So, in order to regulate this type of system, you have to make sure the banks are under control. You have to make sure that the financial markets and organizations that are publicly traded, that is stocks on the exchange have to be regulated. We have to know what they're doing. We have to make certain that we have controls in place to ensure that they are not taking money or misleading um their investors. 
um, then you also have to make sure that um, there are other organizations who are involved that they are um, in they are working to help establish rules that that allow for the flow of money in such a way that people are not cheated and not stolen and also not misappropriating um, funds that have been given to them for purposes of investing. And again, this is an extremely complex subject, but as an overview of the business process, you may very well be interested in going into finance. And this is a very big part of finance, controlling how money flows and the use of that money and an analysis of that money. So this is a good overview of letting you know that finance is extremely wide and extremely deep. Um, and as we conclude, we're going to talk about the financial system as a global perspective. Now, the financial system is definitely a global thing. I mean, when we go to the, the NICE or the, the New York Stock Exchange, we're going to also note that this is transactions occurring um, in many countries around the globe. This is not just the United States. It's very important. Um, but also, we have to know that. So we need to understand that there's global implications in the financial system, period. And it complicates things. And when things go wrong, it has an effect not just in our country, but it has an effect across the globe. It's very important that we understand that role and how connected the financial system is. So we're not just U.S. trade money with other U.S. companies. No, this is international. Um, but so only two of the largest banks in the world are U.S. Institu institutions. Why is that? Because we are an organ we are dealing with global economies and global flow of money. And it's important to note that we are not the biggest and we're not the only um, organizations out there or institutions out there that actually have um, their hands in the financial system. So as I conclude, um, as you read the chapter, key notes to, um, to, to take home. This is a very broad overview of the financial system. It has so many different areas and aspects of it that are far more complex than this class is going to cover. But most importantly, understanding the financial system, what's involved in it, and the key and the excuse me, the key players in the financial system is very, very important. And I think that's the most um, logical starting point as you go through this chapter. Um, thank you very much for your time and listening, and I will talk to you again soon.